Hello and welcome to the Otaku Review. I am your host for this evening, morning or afternoon, Mizaki Ayuzawa. I'm currently on break and was told I needed to do this. So here we are. <music> Watched by the one and only owner of this channel, the Dramatic Otaku. Brooklyn for short. And specifically, what anime and manga she watched in the year 2021. Watched and read, watched and read. This video will be divided into anime and manga. So to begin, I'll be taking the first anime portion, as there is two anime portions to this video. Please don't... Please don't tell anyone I'm doing this. So we are beginning with anime released and viewed in 2021. This section is for the anime that either came out in 2021, had a new season in 2021, or a film adaption in 2021. There will be spoilers ahead for each respective series in each section, but more specifically in the anime sections, a little bit in the manga, but mainly the anime sections. And this short section, I will be breezing through as I am on break. This being Komi-san can't, Komi can't communicate. Now, originally, in the beginning of this year, I did want to read this manga, but when upon picking it up, I didn't think it was worth a read. So I put the manga down. Boy, was I wrong, because as soon as I saw Komi-san Kami can't communicate on Netflix, I clicked it and the first three episodes were fucking bangers and I was hooked. This is the first anime as of this of the past couple of years I'd say that I've actually tuned in to listen to for every single episode per week. Usually I just wait until the full season has come out so I can binge watch it in like three days. Um, the last anime that I did this with and was patient enough to watch the full season was Assassination Classroom season two. So that's been a while. This is an incredible feat of me wanting to watch anime that badly. Komi-san can't communicate. It is a light-hearted comedy, comedy series about Shoko Komi, a socially anxious teen with stunning looks and her wish to make friends. Her crossing paths with the average in every way, Hitohito Tarano. I said that correctly, but it just felt wrong. She soon finds her first friend and the path to many. This is such a fun and funny and adorable anime filled with such eccentric characters and i love komi-san so much she is so fucking relatable like so fucking relatable as i mentioned earlier komi-san can't communicate has such an eccentric cast of characters with the exception of tarano such eccentric characters such as osana najimi the people's person and in the words of Tarano, the embodiment of people skills. And essentially, Komi's antithesis. That's not to say that they're not friends. No, 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 no. They are the best of friends. And Najimi is honestly one of my favorite characters. They're so fucking funny. And like, yes. But I relate to Komi so much in this entire series and i absolutely cannot wait for season two of komi-san can't communicate coming out in 2022 it has been just such a light-hearted and fun series and i can totally recommend i have not done a very good job at portraying how good this series is mainly because i'm trying to read my script and i'm not doing that very well but i can promise you this is worth a watch if you have netflix watch komi-san can't communicate it is very good watch especially if you love light-hearted comedy slice of life type anime a little bit of romance hinted in there as well so yes i'm very excited for season two italia world stars Pasta! Yep.
heard me right, Italia got a seventh season this year. It was fine. I binged it in an hour and a half and yep. Yeah. Italia World Stars is the seventh season of Italia with 12 episodes and three OVAs. I don't know why they didn't just make 15 episodes because there's nothing really special about the three OVAs. This season takes the Italians out of the war era and into the Industrial Revolution, which essentially is a step back from season one. Okay. Um, but it is spearheaded by everybody's favourite hot-headed country, England. But for a season seemingly dedicated to the revolution created by England, England is in it a surprisingly minuscule amount. As is most of the main cast, such as the Axis powers and the allies, as you would typically see in a regular season of Hetalia. It actually focuses a lot more on the side characters and is very much more ensemble based uh, for this season of Hetalia. It's essentially bringing back the dead for a little bit of fun, just like Prussia. So in terms of if I enjoyed it or not, well, it appealed to the little Italian still inside me, um, and I absolutely thrived on the amount of Romano in this season. Chef's... Chef's kiss. I... I can never get too much of Romano. No. And I also love that Romano also got a slight character upgrade in this season. And speaking of character upgrades, there was two characters that I fucking lived for this season and it was not Czech or Slovakia. It was Canada and his character arc of finally being fucking recognized as part of the G8 by our wonderful girl Seychelles. We love her. It's amazing. My boy finally has his character arc sealed and completed. He is finally been remembered with a little bit of effort and then of course the second character that i absolutely lived for this season who got the most character growth in hetalia fucking hetalia that award goes to my boy latvia going from a character that quivers under russia to an extremely capable capable and smart character while still doing work for russia he finds joy in this Industrial Revolution arc by coming, becoming quite capable with railroads and medicines. 10 out of 10 for Latvia, Canada, out of my boy Romano. <laughs> 6 out of 10 for the rest of the series. It's Italia. And I don't know why they didn't just make 15 stuff. Attack on Titan. The final season of Attack on Titan dropped in the winter of 2021. At least the first half of it fucking did. And to celebrate, myself and my partner decided to watch the entirety of Attack on Titan again. We rewatched all of Attack on Titan up until the final episode of the first half of the last season. God damn, that is a mouthful. With the second part of the final season debuting this January, which I am so fucking excited for. Oh, so fucking excited for. Now, I won't spoil season four for anyone um, who wants to watch the series, especially if someone who wants to watch the full season four like once all of season four has you know released i won't spoil it for you there but this was also the first time for me watching season three and obviously season four as i had stopped watching attack on titan after season two just waiting until the series had enough episodes that i could binge and obviously with half of season four being done i decided to binge didn't really expect to do it from episode one of the entire series, but here we are. I had personally really wanted the manga to finish before I watched the entire thing, which it did this year. And due to this resurgence of interest in Attack on Titan, I decided to spoil myself for the ending of Attack on Titan in the manga. It was worth it because I was absolutely dying to know what the hell happens after the end 
of the finale of the first half of the finale season. Season three and four were absolutely fucking thrilling to watch this year, with season three concluding the life within the walls for our young heroes, with the second opening of said season having an amazing nod to all each and every opening before it. 2021 was also the year that I discovered that some of the Great Lakes in the Attack on Titan world were the continents that we live on. Rewatching Attack on Titan at episode two of the first season. <coughs> uh, do you mind telling me why at 10.57 there is a fucking perfect cutout of Australia inside of the second wall? Yes, so within the walls of Maria, Rose, and Sina, you have the Great Lakes of Australia, Africa, and, I and Greenland, sorry, not even Iceland, Greenland. Yeah, I found this quite interesting, and as did you guys over on TikTok, so... All in all, I really fucking love Attack on Titan, and I really, really cannot wait until the last episodes air in January. 10 out of 10 series. My Hero Academia, or Boku no Hero Academia. With season 5 airing in the spring quarter of the 2021 anime season, I once again took the time to re-watch the entire fucking season- the entire fucking anime, sorry. I will spoil this because I'm not gonna lie, I find season 5 incredibly boring. Um, because at this point, I'm really only in the My Hero fandom for Suyu and Kirishima. That being said, there was a whole episode, episode dedicated to Suyu and Uraka, and I didn't watch it because I was just that uninterested. For a majority of the season, I was just not paying attention. However, we did get to see the My Villain Academia arc this season, and that was interesting enough. I mean, we got to see Shigaraki's backstory animated, we got to see a lot of the villains' backstories, with the exclusion of Darby, uh, their backstories animated this time. Um, but the real kicker for this season for me was the discovery, something that I already knew, um, that Kuragiri was a former childhood friend of Aizawa and present Mike. The season leaves on a bittersweet note with the build-up of the Liberation Army battle arc, which brings our young heroes back together to fight, and I'm not gonna lie, I preferred this entire series when it was a funny slice-of-life comedy anime about a boy finally getting his quirk after not having one for half of his life. Now it's just kind of gritty and I don't really like it. <laughs> I preferred when it was more academia <laughs> instead of hero, <laughs> essentially. Um, I do also have this opinion with the manga. No, I'm not reading it. As I mentioned, I like to keep up to date with the happenings going on within the manga. Um, but yeah, My Hero Academia Season 5. 7 out of 10. Will I watch season 6? Probably. I'm in it for the long haul, just because I will. Yeah. Demon Slayer and Demon Slayer Mugen Train. I am well aware the initial release for Mugen Train was in 2020, or at least that's what the fuck Google says. But in Australia, Mugen Train did not get released until February of 2021, so I'm going off that and I didn't watch it until 2021. It is also the Mugen Train arc is technically in season 2, which debuted this year. And yes, I'm using the Mugen Train movie as a cheat because I have yet to watch season 2 because I want to binge it in one sitting. So if you count Mugen Train as, you know, part of the season. I've watched half the ad this season already. Yeah. <laughs> this year I got a Demon Slayer high as I watched the full first season of Demon Slayer, watched Mugen Train, and then could not get enough of the series and decided to bin read the books and finished the books actually, but you'll get to that in the manga section of this video. But that being said, seeing as I will be talking about Demon Slayer in the manga half of this video, 
just to make a whole wrap-up summary of the anime, Demon Slayer as a whole, fantastic. Mitsuri is best girl, fucking fight me on it. Inosuke is best boy, fucking fight me on it. It's a gorgeous looking anime and has an equally amazing plotline and storyline. It's hilarious, it is also gut-wrenching at the same fucking time. And with season 2 having started this year, I love it. Down 10. Well that is all to report for the 2021 anime releases. Now over to our manga correspondent, Sunako Nakahara, for the manga report. Sunako. Do I have to? Well, I would, but I'm currently on break at work and, you know, I'm needed back very, very soon. <laughs> Are you sure I have to do this? Sunako? Manga. This year, um, uh, Brooklyn has, um, real escape manga. <laughs> um, there was a lot from manga that had their final release. Of, of chapter or 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 final volume this year or, or new releases um such such as attack on titan demon slayer genji ito's love sickness um as well as some new finds from the past um but to kick it all off would be her favorite mangaka horror mangaka genji ito Fuck me, is it hot in this cosplay? It is the middle of summer and I am wearing two fleece-stricken things. It has been like five minutes of recording this. So it is no lie. I jumped on the Junji Ito bandwagon this year and I fell in love with these books and in love with this man. <laughs> but there's two stories in particular that I would like to highlight from the year. As much as I have read all of them throughout the year, starting in March with Tomie, Originally thinking it was Tommy and having a stark difference uh, between last year's March, where I was on the train going to uni reading Sailor Moon. <laughs> a bit of a jump between Sailor Moon and Tommy Air, but whatever. But as the years go on, I have used Janji Ito's novels as a great escape from the year that has been 2021. Not as bad as 2020, but still pretty bad. But the two stories that I really want to dive into for this year would be this year's releases as you probably want to know more about those rather than the releases that have been out for several years by now. <laughs> so to start that all off is Love Sickness. The, one of the collections that came out this year, there was supposed to be two collections, that being Love Sickness and Deserter. However, Deserter, was for some reason delayed and will not be coming out until February of 2022. Not the only Junji Ito thing that's coming out in 2022, but I'm making a separate video for that. Please watch it. <laughs> but throughout 2021, two books have been released, that being the first of the two being Love Sickness. Now, this is a story collection. I have actually talked about Love Sickness in a previous video, that being my manga review video. I believe it was that one. That or is one of my clearing manga shelves videos. Yes, I have two, but um, Love Sickness I have talked about before, but here we are talking about again because it's the end of year wrap up. Again, so far this is the latest of the Junji Ito collection releases. I am in two minds about Love Sickness, really. It is an awesome read. However, I do not like this as much as the previous collections released, such that being Smashed, Shiver, or Frankenstein. Yes, I like Frankenstein more than this. I like Frankenstein the most out of the collections. But to me, this felt a little bit lackluster in comparison. There's more of a, there's only really two major stories uh, within this book, whereas in other short story collections, there has been many or just more variations in short story. I found this a little bit lackluster on that part, but I did actually enjoy it. The main story of love, love sickness, I really love. I really loved uh, the main story of love sickness. It was the secondary story of the, I believe, Hidazuki kids. Yes, the strange Hikizuri siblings. 
I'm not a huge fan of that part of the book and there actually is uh, three other stories. One of them's kind of a joke story, the other one's Ribswoman, which I'd actually read before purchasing this book so it didn't really come as a surprise. And I'd have to say the highlight other than the love sickness short stories would have to be the Phantom Pain story. But that's because it's probably the most standout story other than love sickness. With exception to the starter half of the book, the latter of half of the book isn't necessarily my favorite, um, but this is definitely a good read. Do not get me wrong, this is a really good read, especially if you are a huge fan of the little collection series that they have. It's really, really good. It is more lackluster compared to Shiver, Smashed, and Frankenstein. I'd have to say this one's probably the more lackluster of the two, but out of the two, the, it's the more lackluster of the four. However, compared to my next one, my next uh, review, I actually really, really like this book and I would 100% give it a read. I would definitely recommend this book, especially if you like the short story section. That being said, we are going to move on to the most recent of the Junji Udo books. That being Sensor. Now, Sensor was supposed to post date the upcoming short story collection, Deserter. At least from memory and from one of my sources, it was supposed to. And then something happened where Deserter got pushed back, and so Sensor came out beforehand. Now I got this in Minotaur, there was shits tons of it, um, and this is one of the most recent of the long form Junji Ito novels. Now I think all of Junji Ito's long form works are getting shorter and shorter because this feels like it should go in one of these, not gonna lie. Hold on, how long is the Love Sickness one? So this is how big all of Love Sickness is, all of like The Beautiful Boy at the Crossroads, A Woman in Distress, Shadow, Screams of Night, and The Boy in White. All of the stories of lovesickness is that thick. Hmm? This is how bit thick Sensor is. So, so you see, this feels like it should be in one of these stories. However, these are obviously short stories thread together by one main plot point. This is more so an actual, actual general long form story. Sensor is the most recent release as of December of 2021 and probably also in January of 2022. Deserter doesn't come out until February of 2022, so this is the most recent release as of that, this date, okay? So, Sensa is the story of a girl with mystical cosmic powers that she gains after time traveling to another time that's in the past but it's like stuck. It's really weird, okay? It's certainly an interesting read, but it's not necessarily one of my favorite Junji Ito books. Uh, main thing, I really don't like cosmic horror, which is a bit of a shame because this is a cosmic horror book. Um, but I chose to read this over like Hellstar Remina because Hellstar Remina has like actual, it feels more cosmic based. This is Hmm, how, how do I put this? The story features a lot of omnis, omniscient, omnis, this word, beings, um, such as cosmic gods, as you can see on the back of the book. It also talks a bit, a fair bit about like time loops and a bit about Christianity. It has, it has a Christian mercenary in this book and it is apparently a main sort of plot point that it is a Christian mercenary um, and and it's in Japan and it's in I believe it's meant to be in the Edo ish period where this Christian mercenary is and I'm not gonna lie look I'm not gonna lie it's not my cup of tea um, in the slightest. I'm not a huge fan of this book. I much prefer the likes of Uzumaki or Tomie. This one just isn't necessarily my style. 
it, it it's unsettling definitely just not in the fun way that say Uzumaki, Tomie, even Love Sickness is a little more fun in terms of like reading it and being unsettled. Or the legend the Enigma of the Amigata Fault is unsettling in like a fun way. This is unsettling in an unsettling kind of way to me. I did read it, I did buy it. it, is a very nice book. It is not my cup of tea and I much prefer Love Sickness over it. I'm very excited for Deserter coming in February. I've pre-ordered it, pre -ordered it already and I'm, I'm very excited for it. Apparently also, uh, Junjiro's Cat Diary Yonamu is getting a anniversary um, special edition. At least that's what my sources told me. <laughs> but yes, uh, now on to the rest of manga. Uh, and moving away from Junjiro and horror, seeing as this is like highlights of the year. So, Mermaid Saga. Yes, I've got the second volume of Mermaid Saga and I'm showing it to you. But we're just going to talk about Mermaid Saga as a whole here. Because I essentially have the same opinion that I had of it back when I first made my first uh, review of this book in my manga review video a couple months back. Mermaid Saga, this is volume two. There are two volumes to the Mermaid Saga series. They, and it is by classic uh, mangaka Rumiko Takahashi, the creator of Ranma and Inuyasha. Now I'm just gonna cut in the clip from earlier this year into this section here because I again have the same opinion of this series. It's awesome and yeah, cut to past me. Like Mermaid Saga. Um, and I will talk about this in a second. But first of all, QED and Dimmicks. <laughs> Mermaid Saga. Now, if you recognize this art style, uh, it would be because this is the same person who created Inuyasha. And I've never read Inu Inuyasha, I've never watched Inuyasha, but if you're like me and haven't like read or watched Inuyasha or anything else by this creator, I would actually give this a shot. It's really good. Um, there is apparently only two volumes, um, and I need to get the second volume. The problem it's on order! I don't want to wait eight months for another Mermaid Saga. It's so irritating. Um, I'll talk about Minotaur comics and my experience with getting manga from then in about a moment, but I would give this a read, especially if you do love Inuyasha. Um, if you love the art style, uh, if you love the storytelling, I would go with Mermaid Saga. 100%. It's a it's basically a bunch of threaded together one shots um, of well an immortal man who only became immortal because he ate the flesh of a mermaid and that's all I'm going to tell you <laughs> but yes if you pick up Mermaid Saga honestly it's worth a read it's quite thick um, and there are apparently only two volumes so yeah um, Genuinely, I have no other words for Mermaid Saga. I love it. It's really good. I Ore. Ah. I Ore is a 2012 manga that is just... Wow. I picked this up because from the look of it, it looks like sort of a punk rock um, version of a... Or on High School Horse Club, at least that's what it looks like to me. Um, it's got that like g breaking gender norms aspect to it, and it does on like it says it on the back. It's got it like similar, it, it looks all, in general similar vibe to Or on High School Horse Club, at least that's what I thought. Um, and I thought it'd be like, oh, cute love story. This is a woman, this is a man. Breaking gender norms, quite cute. Um, oh my god. Is it not like that whatsoever? Like, it is, it is like the fucked up version of Oran High School Host Club. Oran Gaslight Girl Boss Gatekeep, if, if you will. This, this main character, she, adorable, lovely, I love her. Um, every 
other character. All the other characters are just so awful. Like, I had this, like, crack shit, um, headcanon AU for Orion High School Host Club, and it was, like, the opposites, and it had, like, the opposite versions of the characters, like, um, Hime Haruhi, where Haruhi essentially acts like Renge, but more of a bitch, um, and I never wrote that fanfiction into existence because it would have been fucking awful. This is that fanfiction. This is the fanfiction I never read, wrote. I read the full, the full, first, this is the first volume of this, is, of this series. I don't know how many manga volumes there are for this series. I don't care to read them. <laughs> I read one, okay? I read the full volume for the main character and that is it because it gets worse as you read and the only saving grace is the main character. I have found some very questionable and problematic phrases coming from these characters and some very questionable actions coming from other characters um, and just it left me flabbergasted. And by the fact that I can't pronounce it properly, you can tell that I don't use that word very often. So, um, I order two out of 10 and both of those points go to how cute the main character is. I'm never reading that again. <laughs> okay, the next one, highlight of my year, Kaguya Summer Lovers War. I just, I, Kaguya-sama love as well. I started reading this manga earlier in the year for the main reason that um, my end theme had cheek in it and I hadn't watched the anime and I wanted to read the manga before I watched the anime. Yes, I did put Chika in my ending theme before watching the anime. Shut up. It was worth it. This is a fantastic manga and anime, okay? I'm currently at volume 19 and I've ordered volume 20 because I can't find it anywhere. Um, I've ordered it and volume 21 which comes out in January of next year and they are both on their way. I will be getting them at like January 10th so that's like two weeks from now. I absolutely adore Cookies Summer Loves War if you could not tell. <laughs> I started reading this series originally for Chica as you can probably tell by my end theme but I have found so many other characters that I fucking adore along the way. It is just, I adore this series to its fullest. It is such a funny and enjoyable and adorable series. It is hilarious, it's fun. Give it a read, give it a read, give it a read. It's romantic, it's cute. If I, if I order, is the anti Oran High School Host Club. This is Oran High School Host Club Plus. <laughs> it's upgraded Oran. Yes, I will always continually fucking compare romantic school, high school, rich bitch high, these, these are rich bitch high schools, um, these kinds of novels to Oran High School Host Club because that was the first manga I ever fucking read. So yes, I will always compare it to that. But yes, I am slowly but surely building a Kaguya Summer collection alongside my Sailor Moon collection. So that should say enough for how much I love this fucking series. 10 out of 10. So the last series you can see in the background here, I'm not gonna move that because you can see it. Um, after watching the first season earlier this year, um, and having to wait a smidgen of time for Mugen Train and then season two coming out earlier this year, I decided to read Demon Slayer because I did not want to fucking wait for the movie. With this being the longest full form completed series that I have finished in a year, the previous title holder to that record, the previous holder to that was Al Haru Ride, which is 13 volumes. This was 21. No, it wasn't even, it was like 23. It was a long fucking series. And with the assistance of a loving partner who bought me like seven volumes and me buying the rest, 
I got the full series in manga form right here. My favorite volume being volume 14 because Mitsuri is on the cover. <laughs> All that aside, Demon Slayer is an emotional roller coaster. And especially at the end of the series, and that being said, because not everyone has read the manga and because of the fact that it is currently simulcasting the Red Light District arc, I'm not going to give away the ending to Demon Slayer, but I will be talking about the arc after the Red Light District arc, that fucking being the Swordsmith Village arc, my favorite fucking arc. I wonder why. Now, I will be doing this because having seen the amount of episodes there will be for season two and the red light district arc alone and guessing that unless the swordsmith arc is going to be in another demon slayer movie or it is more likely going to be in season three or seeing how move and train has gone probably both um i would really like to fucking talk about this arc because as i said it is my fucking favorite Favorite arc, Swordsmith Village arc. Why? You get to see my girl Mitsuri so much. You get to see her fight for the first fucking time. You get to see her backstory, what pushes her to be a uh, Hashira, essentially. I love it. I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. You also get to see the face of our beloved Swordsmith, Hotaru. I can't pronounce his surname and whew, it is a damn shame the man needs to wear a mask to pr protect his and his fellow swordsmith's identity because wow it also concludes this arc also concludes that Nezuko really isn't like the other demons neither is Genya <laughs> It's a really, really fun arc, and I just adore it so, 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 so much. And of course, I will, st and of course, I will still watch the anime as it comes out because Demon Slayer is that series that once you read the manga, there will be certain elements of the manga that you can't wait to see animated because it will look just so fucking cool, especially the final arcs of the manga and the anime. <laughs> It will look so fucking cool and I am so excited for the current season that is simulcasting for Demon Slayer because oh my god it is such a good fucking arc. But yes, 10 out of 10, we'll probably read Demon Slayer again. That's it. Back to Mizaki. Um, sorry, uh, Misaki had to go back and do her shift, um, uh, so I'll be taking the rest of the report, um, my name's Toru Honda, and, um, I'll be doing the rest of the anime that Brooklyn watched this year, yeah! I had a anime that came out this year, or at least one of the seasons did, it actually finished this year. Did Brooklyn watch any of it? Fuck no! <laughs> Strangely enough though, Brooklyn watched quite a bit of anime, more than she did in 2020. And that is saying a lot, as in 2020, she had nightly Discord viewings of certain animes. We're gonna get through quite a lot in this section of the video. <laughs> Anyways, on to the anime that didn't come out in 2021, that Brooklyn watched in 2021. Spoilers ahead. Your Lion April. Okay, so I knew she died in the end. I knew that before we watched the anime. <laughs> if you are, or have been in any anime fandom you fucking know that at the end of your line april she dies <laughs> and you fucking know because it is the most common anime joke that there is in the entire fandom so i already knew that she was gonna die did it hurt any less fuck no oh my god i nearly i didn't cry but i nearly cried this is what happens when you spoil yourself for certain anime you nearly cry, but you don't cry. All in all, Your, Li Your Lion April is a really, really good anime, and I would suggest it. Granted, from other interpretations of the uh, anime, I thought it was gonna be like 18 year olds or 16 year olds. They're 14. I didn't fucking know that. So, 
it just hurt that much more. But honestly, Your Lie in April is such a good anime and despite knowing that she was going to die, I just had this moment where I thought, no, surely all these internet jokes are a hoax. Surely she makes it through. She doesn't, but that didn't mean that I wasn't hoping that she'd make it through. Your Lie in April gets a solid 8 out of 10 for me. Shinsa Kayori from the New World. Did I love the story and plot from this anime? Yes. Would I recommend it to anyone? No. <laughs> For the good that comes from the series and the insane plot that groups you in, it has extremely off-putting scenes in the forms of relations between children. This starts off in episode two, and the only time these scenes happen is when the ca main characters are children. Like this, this anime goes through the lifespan of the main character from the age of 12 to like 26. The main plot of the series surrounds small group of characters and the series starts when they are around 10 12 years old and it ends when they're roughly 26. the really awkward and just quite frankly disturbing scenes that i find in the series happens prior to the time skip when she's like 26. yup and it's this starts on episode two why? I don't know. Now, if I had been watching this series by myself, I would not have watched it to its fullest. However, I had been watching it with my partner. And the main reason is because of this gif right here that we found on Discord. That should be a big red flag. We heavily considered stopping the anime after episode two because it just made us feel so physically uncomfortable when watching it but we were determined to see when this scene was and who apart from the main character was the other character in that gif i can tell you if you also want to watch this anime to find out when this gif is you'll be watching the full anime because this gif is in the last two minutes of the anime and i am not over exaggerating last two minutes we had to sit through a lot of shit to get to this scene. But in the end, we did push through and I am glad we actually did. The plot is fucking amazing. And it is so genuinely interesting. And then there's this huge mystery, there's multiple mysteries actually, about how this super society, because that is what this series is, is about a future futuristic super society of humans and how all the humans have essentially destroyed the world except for this small little group of people who now have psychic powers and almost almost everything in this series has a purpose and it is just so interesting and ties in so well just the amount of questions answered by the end is so fascinating and so like fantastic there is no like threads of information that are left unexplained except for the really questionable scenes <laughs> so 9 out of 10 really could do without the bonobo bloodline thank you death note so i had actually never watched death note before because i knew everything that there had to be with death note because it is an old as fuck and old as fuck anime it was obviously made in the early 2000s and so i already knew everything that happens by the end of this series but as i was doing my sailor moon sewing project i wanted to watch some anime on netflix as i was doing it and preferably something with an english dub so that i could focus on my sewing while also watching a series now i started off with jojo's bizarre adventure first season's boring as fuck so I didn't really want to watch the first season <laughs> so I switched over to Death Note and I'm very glad I did the first uh, I believe season of Death Note is fantastic I love it it's a bit of a mind fuck at certain parts um, I do have to note that I had actually watched the live action version of Death Note so going from that to the actual animated series it is actually a bit of a switch because in the, uh, the live action version of Death Note uh, L dies, but so does Light, and they die at the, or one after the other, 
in sync, essentially. Um, that doesn't happen in the Death Note anime, and that took me by surprise, which is stupid because I sh probably should have known that was gonna happen, because live actions typically don't have the same endings as their anime counterparts, as not to give away, you know, the ending to the anime or to the manga, or it could be different, they could be different creative directors, etc. But I just have to say, I really, really love Death Note. It is such a, I was gonna say fun anime, but my definition of fun won't be your definition of fun. There is a bit of a lull within the second season before Light is revealed as Kira, because spoilers, Light is Kira. The first season with L is definitely fun. I feel like the second season with uh, Nia and the other guy <laughs> is a little bit lackluster. I didn't have as much fun watching that season as I did the first season. So yeah, that, that that's essentially my opinion of Death Note. I really, really enjoyed it. It definitely lives up to being a really good classic anime and I would suggest watching it, especially if you are like me and just need to have something on that you're genuinely interested in in the background while you're doing something else because this was the perfect anime to do that. I feel like if I just sat down and watched it, I wouldn't have been as interested in it, but because I was doing something while watching it, I watched it the whole way through and actually really enjoyed it. Speaking of animes that I decided to start on Netflix because I was doing something and needed something in the background. Psyche K. Now, unfortunately for me, there's only, I believe, one season of Psyche K that's dubbed, and I initially only watched that one season because I had been cutting uh, up the fabric pieces and then sewing the fabric pieces to my cosplay. Um, however, as soon as it hit the second season, there was no more dub. So I actually had to physically watch all of Psyche K um, because I did get really invested in this series. Obviously, if you don't know what Psyche K is and you've just seen like the TikToks or the, the shifting uh, TikToks about it, um, Psyche K is a really funny series. I have to say it's probably very similar to Gintama, which is also really funny because they did a small collab with Gintama at one point. Just in general, it's a very funny and fun-loving series. Uh, I really like that there is actually plot development for Psyche um, and yeah it, it's genuinely a really funny series. I watched all of the seasons of it and even the Netflix only reawakened short series of it um, and yeah it, it was it was a lot of fun. I'd give it a solid like 9, 10 out of 10 really. They, they, with all anime, there was a little bit of a lull, but this anime genuinely made me laugh and I love it a lot. I really want to do a Psyche K cosplay in the future because I just love the anime that much. So yeah, I really enjoyed Psyche K and I'd suggest watching it. Kaguya-sama, love is war. Now, I really love Kaguya-sama as I mentioned earlier in this video. Kaguya-sama is such a fun series. I'm not really going to go into the anime except for maybe the fact that where there are certain gags that may not make complete sense in the manga that were still funny, the anime heightens that so much more. I think my favourite scene has to be Chika whacking Ishigami with like the little fan thing because I don't remember that being in the manga but that is just so much fucking funnier in the anime. I remember that scene, I don't remember her whacking him with a fan, but where the manga lacks in certain parts, the anime just further pushes forward the comedic intent of the anime. And I find it amazing. I didn't get to watch season two because season two is on fucking Funimation. Yay! But um, I got to watch season one and I really, really enjoyed it. So... Yeah, I'm just gonna leave Kaguya-sama Love is War here because obviously you heard my praises for Kaguya-sama in the manga section. I essentially have the same opinion with the anime section. So, moving on. Backstreet Girls, the Goku Dolls. This was another English dub anime on Netflix that I could put on in the background. Goku, do Goku Dolls is very mediocre, I'd say. It's not... I think there was one moment where I genuinely laughed, but it was for a second, it's because it kind of took me off guard. It's... It's one of those unconventional, like, trope animes, like, one of my favourite unconventional trope animes would be, obviously, 
the icon for my channel, uh, Magical Girl Ore which is an unconventional trope on the magical girl genre and I thought that Goku dolls would be similar it's a pretty mediocre anime in my opinion uh, essentially it is about uh, this Yakuza boss who's seen how popular idol groups can be and decided to turn three of his men into idols but they're female idols <laughs> It is pretty telling on like idol industry stuff, how like they subject the once Yakuza to idol members uh, to the same treatment as idol idols would have in like the real world, like pushing them to their limits to when they can't work anymore. It, it's a pretty good commentary on that, but other than that, um, it's pretty mediocre. I get it's supposed to be comedic. The English dub personally has a little bit of poor taste in it. Um, I think the entire series does, to be quite honest. But um, if we want something on in the background that's just a little bit bizarre, I put on Goku, do Goku dolls. It's yeah, it's pretty me mediocre. I didn't really enjoy watching it all that much, but I was doing something while watching it. So having that on in the background was good enough. It, they, they could have been a lot of places this anime could have gone and it just didn't go anywhere. So yeah, we're just gonna move on from that. I give Goku dolls about five, no, yeah, five out of 10, a little lower than Hitalia. It was okay. I did have a little bit of a laugh at it. Not my thing. <laughs> and finally, BNA, otherwise known as Brand New Animal. It was okay. <laughs> so I binged this series in one day and it was pretty good. It was a 12 episode anime that plot wise probably should have been 24 episodes or maybe two seasons worth of anime. I get Netflix probably didn't commission 24 episodes and only 12, but the plot feels very bare bones and the only character that I could physically connect with was the main character like this character here super important for the final act of the anime um I have zero connection to this character and I was fully paying attention to this series as it came out like I wasn't doing anything else I was watching this anime um no clue what this guy's connection is to the main character other than they work together <laughs> that's about it um i cannot get a read on like the main character and his specific relationship there's the framework for an interesting story and you can definitely see it there yet due to the episode restriction i feel like it just couldn't be flushed out in the ways that it should have been to the anime's advantage, it takes a very obvious villain and gives him the like most ultimate plot twist. I genuinely did not see it coming. He's a bigot, just not in the way that you would expect. And that's what I really like about this show. Though that may have just been me, but the soundtrack also does fucking slap. I really wish there was more to this anime. And yes, to the advantage of the anime, the soundtrack is fucking amazing. <laughs> I give this anime a seven out of 10. And that is all of the anime and manga I watched and read in 2021. I'm very excited for the new year and the ability to finally, finally watch Belle in cinemas even for the briefest amount of time. Um, will you get another movie vlog? Maybe. But we'll be seeing what I enjoy, or seeing what I would like to see in 2022 in the next video. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. I have been the Dramatic Otaku, cosplaying the cosplayers that she did not get to cosplay this year because she's been quite depressed. <laughs> If you want to see live reactions of me reacting to certain animes uh, or making cosplays or photos of my cosplays, 
you can head over to my Instagram at bookieisdreaming on Instagram or you can go down into my link tree to see all of my other social media. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I genuinely really enjoyed the anime that I watched this year and cannot wait for next year. So yeah, I upload every Wednesday at 10am Australian Eastern Daylight Time and I hope to see you there. Bye!